today, I want to share a word that has impacted me greatly. When I was your age, I found this desire in me to get to know God better. And I wanted to see what he had for my life. If you grew up in a church or if you've been in church at least two or three times, you've probably heard Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys know what I'm talking about? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then you, you, know, you embrace some of these verses and you're like, yes, God has plans for me. This is awesome. This is amazing. I want that. And then you start to read the Bible a little bit more. And every verse is in a text. Every verse has a context. And then the more I started to read that, I'm like, is that really for me? That's actually talking about the nation of Israel and how God had plans for them. And then I'm like, uh, have I believed the wrong thing? Is, is that really what the text is about? But I knew that there was a desire in me to get to know who God was. And if that verse was true for me or only for Israel back then. So I started to read the Bible. I started to study it. I started to try to understand what it is that God had for my life. What the plan was for me. And I called this message and this series, actually, that we're starting today, CPR. Everyone say this with me, CPR. CPR. So I want you to just remember those, th those three letters, CPR. If you remember those three, you're going to remember this message. You're going to take it home with you, and this is going to make a difference in your life. CPR stands for called. Everyone say called. Called. For a purpose. Okay, thank you. For a purpose. And that purpose is relationship. Called for a purpose that is relationship. That changed my life. And I wanted to see how it is and what text that that came about when I was your age and I was studying the book of Ephesians. So I want you to turn your Bible with me or follow on the screen to Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The title, like I said, for today specifically, we're going to go over the first part, which is called. Called. The word called was already all over the songs. I don't know if you got it. We talked about being called through all four, three songs. Not Hosanna. Which, by the way, I got to talk about that a little bit. Do you guys know what Hosanna means? Because we sing it, and then sometimes we're like, I don't know what it means. Right? We just sing it along, Hosanna, Hosanna. Like we're assuming we're praising God, right? Hosanna is so deep that I'm telling you, guys, start to study the word of God. Everything else will make more sense in life. I'm telling you, everything else will make more sense if you start to study the word of God. Hosanna comes, this phrase, this name that we call, this thing that we say to Jesus. It was first said when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem for the first time riding a donkey. And you're like, what's the big deal about all that? There's so much. There, we could do a whole message on this. But just to summarize, Hosanna means, we sing it right after, Hosanna in the highest, right? It's praised be to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus came. If you know a little bit of the Bible, the Old Testament ends with no end. You, you have these prophets talking about the one who is to come, but he doesn't show up. Not in the Old Testament. There is these prophecies, these promises from God that he would send one who would rescue his people. Who would be the Savior. Who would be the Messiah. Who would be the one who would rescue them from the nations around. From the dominion around. From the ruler of this world. And who would set them free. But then the Old Testament ends and that person doesn't show up. It's almost like the story isn't over. And then we flip two pages and we get to Matthew chapter 1. And what happens there 
a genealogy of who? The Messiah, Jesus, the Savior. God is faithful. He sends what he promises. So Jesus shows up, and the first time he rides this donkey, another prophecy that the prophets told hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth, Jesus walks into Jerusalem riding a donkey. You see that all the way back, hundreds of years before in the Old Testament, saying that there would be a day where someone would come, the Son of Man, the Son of God, and he would be riding on a donkey. So Jesus walks in, and they start to realize this is the one that God promised would come. So they start to sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed are you, blessed are you, Jesus, who's come in the name of the Lord to save, to rescue, to set us free. Do you see how the more we read the Bible, the more we study it, even the songs we sing make more sense. They get deeper. So as you're singing Hosanna next time we ever sing it here, you're going to remember this. You're going to be like, yes, blessed is he who has come in the name of the Lord. Blessed is Jesus. Lift it up. Be the name of Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, the one who is my Redeemer, my Rescuer. And today, I wanted you to also focus on the word called. Because if you remember two words that Jesus said, right before he goes to call the first disciples, Peter and Andrew, what does he say? Follow me. Follow me. What is that? That's an invitation. They were called by Jesus to follow him. They were called by Jesus to a life of purpose. Bear this in mind. These people had their jobs. They had families. It's not like they were bored at home. They had nothing to do. They were just waiting for the Messiah to show up. No, they were going about their lives. And Jesus shows up and he says, come and follow me. They were called by him. And a lot of times what we do is, and I mentioned this to you, we read stuff in the Bible and we go, yeah, that's history though. That's what Jesus did back then. Like me with Jeremiah 29, 11, right? I'm like, that's what Jesus said to the nation of Israel. That he, has, he had plans for them. Jesus called Peter and John and Andrew, but I don't know if he calls me. How do I know that he is calling me. So I wanted you to see this in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says this. This letter, just like the letter we are studying in Philippians, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Right here, he's already giving us so much. Look at what, how he sees himself. Paul chosen by the will of God. He's already telling us something here. He is chosen by God himself with a purpose to be an apostle, a messenger of Christ Jesus. And he says, I'm writing this to God's holy people in Ephesus, a city, who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Very similar to the introduction we have to the book of what? That we were just studying and are studying. Philippians, that's right. Very similar. Very similar. Now, let's go into the letter. Verse 3, look at what he says. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before, and this is the verse that changed my life, and my prayer as I was preparing this message, as I was reading this, is that it would change yours. Look at this verse. Even before he, Jesus, made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God 
loved you. And God chose you before he even created the universe. Before your parents thought of having you, God had called you. God knew the plans he had for you. Before he put the first human being on earth, before he created the heavens, before he created the waters, before he did anything else, he loved you and he chose you. That blew my mind. When I started to think about how deep and how far back his love and his choice, his love and his decision to be in my life and to write my story and to walk with me and to have this one-on-one relationship with me, this blew my mind. He chose me before he even made the world. He loved me before I even existed. And here, to me, and I hope you get how deep this is, after he says, chose us in Christ, he says, to be holy and without fault in his eyes. The question, every, sin, every single time I read this, I think, how? If you're honest with yourself and you look at your life, God has called you to be holy and without fault in his eyes. If you know yourself well, you should ask the same question. How is he going to do that? How? Holy means sacred, means pure. Another word for holy is consistent. How many inconsistencies do you find in yourself? I mean, just be honest. How many times? We just went over a whole series called The Masks We Wear. Because sometimes we're one person here, one person there, one person with other group of friends, one person with parents. And God has called us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So the question then should be, how? How is he going to do that? And the Bible answers our questions right after. Look at what verse 5 says. God decided, again, same word here, in advance, beforehand, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself. Here is the recipe. Do you want to change? Do you want to live differently? Do you want to embrace this calling that God has for you? Here's the recipe. Here's what we need to do. You need to first understand that he has loved you. He has chosen you. Your sins, they're paid for. Your mistakes, they are erased. You are free. Understand that. He paid for it all when he gave his blood on a cross. He set you free from that. He's not counting your sins against you. Before you even committed any sin, he had chosen you. He had loved you. He knew all the mistakes you make. He knew it all. He knew it. Yet he loved you. Yet he chose you to be holy and without any fault in his sight. How? Again, decision. God looked at your mess. God looked at my mess. And he said, I'm going to bring Matt into my family. But Matt is messy. But Matt doesn't always obey me. But Matt has got some dirt in his heart. Yeah, but I, I want him. I loved him. And I'm decided Matt is a part of my family. You are a part of his family. And he brings you in. He brings you in. He's decided to adopt us. Through Jesus Christ. This is the how. Do you know how you can be without fault and holy? Through Jesus Christ. 
Do you know how you can be adopted into a perfect, holy, pure family? Through Jesus Christ. It is the only way. He is the only perfect son of God. We only go in through his effort, through his obedience, through his sacrifice, through his blood, the big G word, through his grace. We are loved, chosen, adopted, brought into the family through Jesus Christ and his grace. It is the only way. This is why I wanted to sing that song with you that I know you know. I know you probably, you're tired of it. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. This is what Jesus has done for you and for me. And the verse continues. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. Think about this. It gave God pleasure to think and to decide to love you, to choose you, and to bring you into his family. How crazy is that? It brings joy to his heart when he thought, there's a messy mat out there. And I'm going to bring him into my family. I'm going to forgive him. He's going to be holy and without any fault in my eyes, in my sight. How does he do that? Through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Verse 7, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Last verse, verse 8, he has showered his kindness on us, showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. I don't think you understand how much this changed my life, how much this one word, chosen, changed me, called. I don't know if you've ever been, I know some of the guys here, if you play pickup soccer or pickup basketball, or actually, there are other games that you can do too, um, where there are two captains and they're picking teams, right? What'd you say? Say dodgeball? Yeah, yeah, dodgeball. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's a classic one, right? All right. And then they start to select teams. Have you ever been the last person to be picked? Isn't it awful? They save the best for last. All right, tell yourself that, all right? It is awful, isn't it? You're like, oh, okay, don't fight too hard for me, all right? And sometimes there's even a pride in us that's like, I'm going to show you what you missed out on, right? Um, but there's this idea in us that we want to be chosen. We want to be the first pick. We want to be the first one. We want to be selected. And here, this text reminded me and is reminding you that God chose you before he even made anything. Before anything. He selected you. He chose you. He loved you. Before you ever made one mistake in your life, he had already chosen you. He had already called you to be holy and faultless in his sight. When the time came for Jesus to be crucified, when the time came for the Son of Man, the Son of God to come, it's a word that we use in, in, in the study of God and study of the Bible, the incarnation where God became flesh. When the time came, he thought of me, he thought of you. He did it because he remembered he did it because you were always in his mind. There's, a, there's a one sentence that helped so much. Because sometimes we feel abandoned by God. We feel like, oh, you know, I know he did that back then, Matt, but what happens now? What is he doing in my life now? Sometimes I feel like he forgot about me, that he abandoned me, that I'm going through a rough time. And I remember listening to this pastor once. Paul Washer, if, you, if you're ever like, hey, what do I listen to during the week? If you're not listening to um, the podcast that we have or anything else that we um, provide during the week, listen to this guy, 
Paul Washer on YouTube. Um, and he has this one line that really helped him. He said this, you cost Jesus too much for him to forget about you. So whenever you feel like, oh, he forgot about me, no, it's impossible. You cost him too much. You cost him too much. Every now and then I, I, I remind the worship team how much our stuff costs. Because sometimes, you know, people come into the worship team and we think, oh, you know, uh, it's just a microphone. You know, sometimes it looks like, I don't know, a little bent or something. So we think, oh, that's like 50 bucks. And now I'm like, let me tell you how much those cost. And sometimes when people, like, are clumsy and then they drop something, I'm like, do you remember how much those cost? Do you have any idea how much those cost? And it's, I'm not going to tell you exactly, but it's much more than $50. A lot more than $50. And once you remember that, you start to appreciate it more. You start to be more careful with that. If you have a pair of really expensive shoes, for example, you probably take better care of it than the other ones that you paid 20 bucks for or 30 bucks for. If you have something that's really special, I shared with you guys, I had a pair of sneakers that my dad gave me, and they're not the best looking shoes out there. They're not the most expensive shoes, but to me, they're precious. Why? Because of where it came from. Because of my relationship with him. Which is the point that I want to end with. Why would God love you? Why would God choose you? And I know that there's a, there's a, there's a lot of preachers out there telling you it's because you deserve it. It's because you are worthy. It's because you're amazing. It's because you're awesome. That is not what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Bible teaches. Go read Romans 5, 8. It actually says the very opposite. It said, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not because you were good. It's actually because you were so bad. You were so lost. We see this in chapter 2. Actually, he says that you were dead. And you belonged to Satan. But he had so much mercy on you and so much love for you that he went and he rescued you. He brought you to him. He cleansed you through his son. It's not because you were good. It's the very opposite. It's because he was good. The gospel is not about us. It's about Jesus. Every time you're hearing a message, it should make you fall more in love with Jesus, not with yourself. He is the only perfect son of God. He is good. We are not. He loved you. And the more you see the difference, the immense distance between you and his goodness, the more you start to appreciate his grace. The more you start to value the cross. Some of you saying, my wealth is in the cross like this. My wealth is in the cross. Oh, that sounds like an old hymn. Can we be over it with it? Why? Because you haven't understood how sinful you are and how great he is. It hasn't gone into your heart how amazing his grace is. It hasn't sunk in. It hasn't gone in how much he loves you. And my prayer was that today he would open your spiritual eyes. He will open your eyes to see how amazing he is. That he chose you. That he called you. That he loved you before he even created the universe. He thought of you. He drew a plan for you. He wrote your story. And the most important part, he wrote himself in it. He chose you to have a relationship with him. And this is why, I don't know if you're going to remember the story, but in the Old Testament, there's a story where God comes to Moses through a burning bush. Maybe you've heard that story before. And the first thing that God tells him is that, take off your sandals. You guys remember that? There's a burning bush. 
God shows up to Moses, and Moses is curious. He's like, how the heck is there a burning bush here? There's no fire around. And, most important part, it's not getting consumed. I don't know if you've seen a, anything on fire, especially that has leaves. It dissipates. It disappears. It catches on fire, and then it just becomes smoke or ashes. This burning bush would not stop burning. So he thought, something's up with us. It's not normal. The miracle was not just that it was on fire. It's because it wouldn't get to ashes. So he goes near it, and then he hears the voice of God, and God tells him right away, take off your sandals because you stand on holy ground. Where God is, so is his holiness. Guys, this is so important. Because when you pray, for example, you are getting close to the burning bush. When you talk to God, you got to think about this. You are talking to someone who's holy. When you say, Jesus, come near me. Jesus, I need, I need to hear your voice. Jesus, when you talk to him, you are approaching God. And you stand on holy ground. So when he says, take off your sandals to Moses... And then we see this in the New Testament that he calls us into a relationship with him. Something must have happened between that. Because if you're honest with yourself, are, do you think you're holy enough to stand on holy ground before God? Of course not. So something must have happened for you to be welcomed in. With your sandals, with your shoes, with your mess. Something must have happened and what happened is what we're celebrating this month what are we celebrating this month as christians more than halloween i'll give you this hint reformation the protestant reformation i'm going to teach you two things about it today the 99 99 say you said 95 95 theses martin luther if you don't know what i'm talking about go to netflix Type down Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., okay? Great guy as well. Christian, great politician, but we're not talking about him. We're talking about Martin Luther, okay? The great reformer. There was a time in history where Martin Luther, who was a monk, he studied. There's so much that, into that story. That I, I don't have a lot of time to go into it. But he was also changed. And he wanted everyone to understand verse 8 of chapter 2 of this book we're in now, which is Ephesians. I want to read it to you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, it is by grace you have been saved. This is not from you, this is the gift of God. Sometimes we can give into the idea that we are saved, accepted, called, loved, forgiven by our own efforts, by what we do. We think we're better than other people. We go to church. We don't sin as much as other people do. Or at least we don't do the big sins, right? So then we almost start to think, well, oh, it kind of makes sense that God loves me. I mean, I sacrifice myself. I'm not doing, I'm not sleeping around like everybody else. I'm not doing all these drugs. I'm not killing anybody. I'm not hating on people. I'm not racist. And then we start to think we're pretty good. And here is the problem. The moment you think you're pretty good and you're almost deserving of God's forgiveness, you don't get it. This is why Jesus was very harsh on the religious leaders of the time. They didn't understand that they needed forgiveness and healing and power from him. They thought they were good. They thought they were pretty good people and Jesus was harsh on them. So whenever you think, oh, I'm pretty good, the requirement that you have to receive his grace is taken from you. Grace is given to those who that understand that they don't deserve it. Who understand reckless love. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, he gives himself away. 
that's when you understand. Whenever you feel like, God, you are so good and I don't deserve you. God, you are so good and I know that I fall short. That's when he is near. That's when you can understand that he's working in you. He's got a plan for you. But if you still think, oh, I'm pretty good. I'm not racist. I'm not killing anybody. I'm not a rapist. I'm not this. And you start to think of other people and their big sin. You're not getting the point. The closer we are to the light, the more we see the imperfection in us. So how do you know you're getting closer to Jesus? Do you see more and more failure in you? Do you see more and more inadequacy in you? Do you see more and more spots that need cleaning? That's how you know if you're getting closer to him. That's how you know. The closer you are to the light, the more you get to see the details. And the details drive you to Jesus and his grace. And you say, Jesus, why, why don't you cleanse me? Why don't you clean me? I need you to forgive me. I need you to heal me. And the good news is that that is available to anyone who would believe. What is the most famous Bible verse? And I hope you know this by now. What does it say there? I see some of you doing just this. To pretend, you know. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> that is a very famous one too. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That what did he do? He gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is grace. God calls us when, when we put our trust in him. When we put our faith in him and what he has done. You see this? In the beginning, you see this clear with Adam and Eve. You see this with Noah. You see this with Moses. You see this with Abraham. These were not good people. These were not holy people. These were not perfect men and women. Not at all. But they trusted in God. They trusted him. They trusted in his character, in his grace, in his love. They trusted that God was gracious. They trusted. They believed that God would make a way for them. They believed that God was forgiving them. They believed. They believed. They believed. And God credited it to them as righteousness. God calls you faithful. God calls you righteous when you put your trust in him, when you put your faith in what he has done for you through the cross. The second thing and last, I'll finish with this, that Martin Luther wanted people to understand. The first one is that you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what Jesus has done, and you put your trust in that. And then secondly... Some, it's a big term, but I'll explain what it means, and it'll make sense. It's a universal priesthood. That you don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You don't need someone to talk to Jesus for you. You have access to him. When you open your Bible, and when you get your knees on the ground to talk to him, he's there with you. He's there for you. He reminds you, I have called you, I have chosen you, I have loved you, I have forgiven you. We are in this together. You have access to that. You have access to that. This is what we celebrate in October. Not darkness, but the triumph of the light and the kingdom of God. What Jesus has done for us. This reminder that he's called you, that he's chosen you before the creation of the universe to have a relationship with him, to walk with him, to never be alone in life, to never face anything alone, including your own darkness and sin.
to never face that alone. You have him. You have him. You have him. So how, what do we do with this? And I wrote a couple of suggestions. Maybe this morning, it's a morning for you to say thank you. It's a morning for you to just take this, and as it happened to me, I, it, it melted me on the inside when I started to understand that he chose me, that he selected me, that he called me, that he loved me. Before I was even born, he already knew me. He already knew the day that he would open my eyes spiritually. He knew the day when I would go from being dead spiritually to being alive spiritually, for having no purpose in life to having a purpose in life. He knew the day that he would win my heart, bring me into his family. That melted my heart. And my prayer is that it's happening to you this morning as well. So maybe what you can do this morning is just say, Jesus, thank you. Or secondly, Lord, I, I need to put my faith in you. I need to put my trust in you. Will you stop trying to do life your way? And turn to him who has chosen you, loved you, brought you into the family before you were even born. Before he even created the world. For he knows the plans he has for you. Now I understand that the promise to Israel in Jeremiah 29 11 is also applicable to me in the New Testament and to you. Because he has also called us, chosen us, forgiven us. Why don't you bow your head? Close your eyes. We're going to finish with a word of prayer. But I want this to be not my prayer. I prayed this already. I heard this message one day. And I responded to it. He melted my heart through it. Is he doing that with you? Or is your heart actually getting harder? Is your heart actually getting colder? What is it? Where is your heart this morning? Think about it. And tell him bluntly and clearly. Say, Jesus, here I am. Here I am. I can't believe this, Lord. You loved me before you even created the universe. You called me to be pure in your sight, Lord. And that's through Jesus. That's through your son. That's through what you have done. I can't do that, Jesus. I can't do this. Thank you that you've chosen me. Thank you that you've called me. You are so rich in kindness and grace. What a gift you've given me. And I thank you that I can receive this by putting my faith in you, by placing my trust in you and your son and what you've done for me. Jesus, we, we praise you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Martin Luther. We thank you for Paul. We thank you for Jeremiah. We thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that one day you opened my eyes and this melted my heart. And Lord, I just ask and I thank you, Lord, for the ones that are in here this morning that are also getting their hearts melted before you. I thank you, Lord, for the eyes of those that are being opened. I thank you, Lord, for those who are falling in love with you more this morning when they understand that you've chosen them before you even created the world. Before you said, let there be light, you had already decided our destiny, that you would come into our life, that you would have a relationship with us, that you would love us, that you would walk with us, that you would not let us go through life alone, that you would be our father. And Jesus, we know that we can't do this without you. We're not good enough. As we sing here, Lord, we mean it. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. So we respond, what a love. What a God. What grace. How amazing are you, Jesus? How amazing are you? I thank you, Lord, so much. Now help us. Because your text here ends reminding us that you've also showered us with your kindness 
resulting in wisdom and understanding. Lord, so how we live now points to that. Show us, Lord, the traps that the enemy puts around us. Show us, Lord, where our hearts are even lying to ourselves. Show us, Lord, the way we should go because you know us better than we know ourselves. Show us, Lord, where to go. Show us where to say no to self because it will lead to destruction. Show us, Lord, don't let us fall into temptation as you taught us to pray, Jesus. But deliver us from the evil one. Help us to walk towards you. Help us to stay in the path, in the plan that you have for us. Lord, we sang, Lord, the second song here today that we want to put our first love every single day of our lives for you. Jesus, help us to fall more in love with you. Help us to fall more in love with you. You are so in love with us. So help us to fall more in love with you. You deserve it. You are awesome. You're amazing. I pray this, Lord, over every person that's here. I pray that you answer their prayer. I thank you so much, Lord, that you are not a God who needs us to go to a priest, to a pastor, to a whoever, Lord. You hear us when we cry to you, each of us. You don't have special son or daughter. You have sons and daughters. There is one family, one God, and one bridge, which is your son, Jesus. And through him, Lord, we are all the same. And we thank you for that. Remind every single one of my students here this morning, Lord, as they go home, that they have access to you, that you have loved them, that you have chosen them, that you have adopted them, that they're part of the family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Did you pray that with me?